I'm the Mystical Green Beanie. Thanks for watching, and as always, until next time, until next time, until next time. Okay, honest to God, I had no idea it was going to take that long, but better late than never, right? <laughs>
technically it takes place between the pages of Ultimates 2, and some of that doesn't quite make sense with the status quo that certain characters have in Ultimates 2, namely Thor, because at this point in time, Thor, who I'll get to later, uh, but it makes no sense for him to be part of the Ultimates in their fight against the Kree at this point, because he has divorced himself from the Ultimates based on what happens in the beginning of Ultimates 2, so that doesn't make any sense. And it is worth noting that Marvel's Ultimate Comics imprint suffered heavily from, frankly, indefensible continuity errors. Be that as it may, both Ultimate 6 and Ultimate Nightmare, which is the first part of the Ultimate Galactus trilogy, centered heavily around the legacy of Captain America. For all intents and purposes, Steve Rogers was the Ultimate Universe allegory for the bomb. As Black Widow puts it in Ultimate Nightmare, Steve Rogers was the last thing that anybody expected and broke every convention of conventional warfare, which terrified everybody. Because even though Cap was reported KIA with multiple eyewitnesses, the simple fact that the Americans cracked the human genome pushed the 20th century into a genetic cold war as opposed to a nuclear cold war like in the real world and the original 616 Marvel Universe. Which, by the way, Ultimate Nightmare is just such an underrated comic book. I know I talk a lot about Ultimate Six and how that book ends with the gut punch of Steve looking upon the Sinister Six as his legacy, but Ultimate Nightmare takes it to another extreme where the Ultimates lead a covert mission to an old Soviet R&D facility full of genetic nightmares and failed attempts at recreating Captain America, like Damon Cronenberg's The Unicorn, and a cannibalistic brain-rotted Red Guardian who fashioned a shield out of the remains of his fellow prisoners. Okay, so you can't okay, babies. you don't have to get so clinical and nasty. Which, by the way, all of this is extremely jarring for Steve, because he comes from an era where the Russians weren't our political enemy, and he has no concept of the Cold War. So for him, seeing what Russia broke down into on his account is one of the most heartbreaking things for him to come to grips with. And Warren Ellis, who wrote the Ultimate Galactus trilogy, did a great job of expanding on those ideas of being a fish out of water, but whereas in the first Ultimates, and even in Ultimates 2 a little bit, uh, some of that pathos is played for humor, be it dark or tragic, here, it's just fucking tragic. Because ultimately, ultimately, uh, but ultimately, a lot of the horrors of the 20th century wind up resting upon Steve's shoulders, with Captain America essentially being the bomb, much like in the real world, everybody quickly scrambled to have their version of the bomb, or in this case, their version of Captain America, their super soldier, their bomb, and every nation with a science program, every weapons manufacturer with a defense contract, has been scrambling to have their version of the bomb and make the biggest, most destructive version of the bomb and hoard as many as they possibly can so that they can slap their dick on the big boy table and proudly say to the rest of the world, Look at me, sure. I'm the captain now. And despite this not being the legacy that Cap wanted to leave, it doesn't really matter. As Nick Fury puts it in issue 5 of Ultimate 6, it could have been literally anything. Whatever miracle weapon that would have ended the war from any nation, it would have jump-started what we now refer to as the military-industrial complex. Now, for those of you who don't know, the military-industrial complex is basically a self-sustaining system that perpetuates war. And without getting into the nitty-gritty details, because quite frankly, I'm not qualified to get into the nitty-gritty details, uh, the military-industrial complex is a system that's often referred to as an iron triangle between career politicians, who are backed by lobbyists and private defense contractors, who by and large keep millions of Americans employed, who then go on to vote for career politicians who they know are backed by the people who keep them employed. Meanwhile, these weapons have to be used somewhere and by somebody or else the money invested in their production was a waste. So these private defense contractors sell their product to whoever can afford it, and whoever buys these weapons uses them to go to war with whoever they want to go to war with. 
and career politicians then have to decide whether to back whichever allied country is facing war either directly or indirectly by either putting troops on the ground or providing aid with weapons. Which then ties back to private defense contractors and voter support and you see how this iron triangle is actually more like a weird three-headed snake that folds in on itself and starts sucking its own dick. This in all of its oversimplified glory is the military industrial complex. And that's what I find so powerful about Ultimates 2 and why I say that it's the culmination of everything in the Ultimate Universe to that point. Hell, the first page that is canon to the Ultimate Universe, our introduction to this brand new world, is dedicated to multi-millionaire industrialist Norman Osborn working on developing a patent for a new super soldier formula so that Oscorp can secure a defense contract with S.H.I.E.L.D. So all of that being said, I really felt like I couldn't jump into Ultimates 2 without setting the stage with those two books, and you'll see why. But they're also just criminally underrated comics that I hope more people check out, because I had an amazing time reading them. And with that said, without further ado, now let's talk about Ultimates 2. So Ultimates 2 picks up a few months after the events of the final issue of Ultimates 1, and the story opens with Captain America running a one-man search and rescue operation for several American tourists in Iran. And first of all, looks dope as fuck. Brian Hitch just knows what he's doing. The action is visceral. And when Captain America jumps 600 feet out of a helicopter, you can feel Captain America jumping 600 feet out of a helicopter. And when he uses his shield to bash a door down, you can feel that door getting turned into wood chips. And it's all accompanied by the inks by him as well as Paul Neary, which have this bold cinematic flair, which is all fleshed out beautifully by Laura Martin and Larry Molinar. And just a quick aside, I am not the world's biggest Brian Hitch fan. I don't think he's bad or anything. He's just not my cup of tea when it comes to superhero comics personally. But I really think he works well with this kind of material and with this artistic team in particular. I also love the redesigned Captain America uniform, which is altered from Ultimates 1. It's not a big change, just helmets are better than cowls, and that's a fact. And if you don't believe me, look at Captain America between the first Avengers movie and Age of Ultron. Big difference. But something I think is really interesting about the opening of this first issue compared to the first issue of the first Ultimates, they're both centered around Captain America in a combat situation, but the context is completely different because the dynamic of warfare has fundamentally changed from 1945 compared to 2005. Because in the first Ultimates, the threat Steve Rogers was facing off against was one of the other empires threatening to take over the world, but in 2005, America is the empire that took over the world. And this time around, Steve isn't fighting soldiers who are pawns in some political Game of Thrones. He's literally ripping and tearing through these scrappy fundamentalists like he's playing a Doom Eternal speedrun on the easiest difficulty. And, I don't know, I think there's something to be said about the idea that, back in the first Ultimates, that whole fight sequence takes up an entire issue, whereas here, the conflict is resolved in six pages. So, naturally, this causes an international incident, because the US government promised that their government-issued superheroes wouldn't operate outside of the US borders, and the Ultimates have to do some damage control to keep the general public at ease. Even though, as we see in Ultimate Nightmare, the Ultimates run international ops all the time, just covertly. But with the scale of openness and publicity, some people take this as a sign that the US is taking careful steps to desensitize the world to the idea of the US government putting superpowered troops on the ground around the world. One of these people is Thor, who distances himself from the Ultimates entirely after Captain America and S.H.I.E.L.D. more or less break international law while looking all the other nations of the world dead in the eyes and saying, bitch I'd do it again. So without a doubt, this presents nothing less than an absolute media shitstorm, but if things couldn't get any worse. Somebody leaks to the media that the Hulk is in fact currently employed S.H.I.E.L.D. genetic scientist Dr. Bruce Banner, 
which S.H.I.E.L.D. covered up after the Hulk's rampage in Manhattan, which killed 800 people. And, well, post-9-11 New York reacts about the same way you'd probably expect. Immediately, Bruce Banner is put on trial, and Matt Murdock, despite being a really good lawyer, it's not enough. I mean, for fuck's sake, it was a massacre. That's not a sin easily forgiven. Unless you have double D tits and dressed like a slutty clown, or if your country flag looks like this. So, Banner is given the death penalty, his sentence is death by nuclear fire, which is probably the most extreme enforcement of the death penalty in the history of death penalties. Granted, he's the Hulk, so what else are you gonna do? Shoot him in the face with an arrow? That's just lazy writing. Now, all the while this is going on, Thor is running the media circuit saying that this whole trial of the Incredible Hulk, it's a dog and pony show to distract the world from the real threat that's looming, which is the US deploying people of mass destruction in nations that the US would consider rogue states like Syria or Iran. And this is where the bloody diarrhea meets the overhead ceiling fan. So Captain America, being the beat the ever loving fuck out of somebody first and then ask them questions after the jaw gets rewired kind of guy that he is, confronts Thor at this yuppie club hippie bar that he likes to go to because he thinks that Thor is the one who leaked to the public that Banner is the Hulk because he's been trashing the Ultimates in the media lately. And Thor denies it. Uh, there's even a fun little exchange where he says that he's the number one opponent of the death penalty, which of course leaking to the public that Banner is the Hulk would get him the death penalty. But he also says that he thinks his evil brother Loki might be the one behind all of this which Steve just blows off and walks away because he thinks that Thor is crazy. And that's something that's played for comedy throughout the first Ultimates. People thinking that Thor is just some schizophrenic Norwegian hippie who's living out his psychosis with a bunch of stolen technology. But Ultimates 2, while still played for comedy, a lot of that material is actually explored a little deeper. But I'll talk about that in just a minute. So America's allies in the European Union have secretly started making major progress with their respective super soldier programs. This is how Miller and Hitch introduced the Ultimate Universe versions of Captain Britain, as well as introducing Captain Spain, Captain Italy, as well as Norway's contribution in the form of Thor. Kind of. So, we're introduced to this scientist named Gunnar Golem, whose research into the European Union's super soldier advancement program led him and his country to the creation of their own super soldier in the form of Thor. But as Gunnar puts it, Thor isn't really Thor. He's Gunnar's mentally ill brother who stole research from him and became an eco-terrorist, which S.H.I.E.L.D. was already aware of, but didn't see a problem or a threat to their agenda until very recently. So, on top of Banner's relation to the Hulk being leaked to the press, and on top of Thor's public scrutinization of S.H.I.E.L.D., as well as the Bush administration and the War on Terror, Captain Italy's files were leaked to the press, and the people of Italy aren't entirely on board with advanced militarization. And during a protest, things go south after the Italian police open fire on a crowd and begin assaulting protesters, which is when Thor shows up, and picks a side, and the police get wrecked. And naturally, he's presenting as a bit of a problem. Because yeah, he saved the world from an alien invasion, but he's also suspected of being a mole, leaking classified information to the public, and even if he's not the mole, he's still standing in the way of the Western world's plans for global domination. So the Ultimates roll up on Thor at one of his communes, and they beat him like a black man who fit the right description, and once Thor is in prison, once the moral center of the Ultimates has been silenced, thus marks the beginning of the end of the Ultimates. So remember how Thor was warning everybody how the US was going to start deploying people of mass destruction to nations the West considered rogue states? Well, that's exactly what happens. The US invades a nondescript third world country in the Middle East that's totally 100% not Iraq, and they cripple their economy by forcefully dismantling their nuclear arms facility. And I find it really fascinating that at this point in the book, the perception of the Ultimates are juxtaposed with the perception of other superheroes. And this is where we're introduced to the Defenders, 
who in the Ultimate Universe are just a bunch of raggedy, broke-ass, wannabe superhero amateurs who Hank Pym saddles himself with now that he's been kicked off the Ultimates after, well... Which, by the way, historically proven to probably be the least realistic aspect of this book, but I digress. Anyway, I'm sure fans of the classic comic book iterations of Nighthawk, Hellcat, Son of Satan, Black Knight, Power Man, and Valkyrie would all be very upset at the Ultimate Universe reinventions of the Defenders, all 17 of them. But the thing that separates the Ultimates from the amoral, glory-hounding, cowardly posers that make up the Defenders is funding and PR. The Ultimates are just as fucked up as the Defenders, but because they've got toy deals and t-shirts, nobody cares. And again, I've seen in the comments of my retrospectives for the first Ultimates book, a lot of people are put off by this because they want their superheroes to be valiant and heroic and inspirational, but that's not Marvel. You're thinking of the other one. Marvel isn't the House of Heroes. It's the overly expensive condominium that's perpetually on fire because it's home to substance-addled billionaires, morally bankrupt super scientists, PTSD-ridden soldiers who, in some cases, have had their brains turned into the equivalent of mashed potatoes, political and corporate spies who answer to nobody but their own flimsy sense of morality, and average Joes who dress up in colorful costumes and play night watchmen in the neighborhoods, beating up other average Joes so they can exercise their demons in the street rather than seek therapy for their trauma. The Marvel Universe is a glorious shit show of people who cannot get their shit together, which causes ripples in the world around them, leading to all of these classic stories that we know and love today. That, baby, is what makes Marvel, Marvel. And all Mark Miller and Brian Hitch did was take the bones that the classic Marvel Universe was founded on and update them for a contemporary audience. Now, that being said, going back to Hank Pym, after he joins the Defenders, and after that goes about as well as anybody would have expected, Hank reaches an all-time low. Lower than banging jailbait while role-playing as the man who's banging his wife. Because this is where he's persuaded to commit grand treason against his country and help foreign powers launch an attack on the United States of America. And just a quick aside, uh, there were two annuals for this series. The second isn't really all that important. It's just Captain America and Falcon teaming up to kill Arnim Zola. It's fun, but it's more like a tacked-on epilogue to the end of the series. But the first annual is all about S.H.I.E.L.D. trying and failing to replicate the super soldier formula and testing it out on S.H.I.E.L.D. agents who could potentially, in any event, replace Steve Rogers as Captain America. It's really good, and it's drawn by the incredibly talented late Steve Dillon. And for the life of me, I don't understand why it's not collected in the Ultimate Collection of Ultimates 2. I think it's in the Omnibus, but still... It's really important, and it adds a lot to the book, which I'll get to in just a minute. So, in the classic 616 Marvel continuity, there's a supervillain team called the Masters of Evil. They're basically Marvel's equivalent to the Legion of Doom. It's a team comprised of various A-list Marvel supervillains who seek revenge on the Avengers, and Mark Miller and Brian Hitch more or less take the Masters of Evil concept, and they flip it on its ear and make them more analogous to the Ultimates. So instead of being independent agents and instead of calling themselves the Masters of Evil, in the Ultimate Universe, the team is reimagined as a paramilitary strike force counter to America's Ultimates. And each member is a super soldier representative of their home nation, nations which are economic and political rivals to the United States of America. China brings both Abomination and Crimson Dynamo to the table, Swarm is a representative from North Korea, Hurricane is the result of Syria's super soldier program, Perun is, of course, Russian Thor, and I think Russia also replicates Jamie Madrox's abilities and creates the Schizoid Man. And finally, there's the Colonel, who hails from, not Iraq, uh, the first man responsive to the original super soldier program invented by the United States of America in World War II. Which is exactly why the first annual for Ultimates 2 is so important. Also in issue 8, Steve is framed for killing Hawkeye's family 
and the ultimate reserves are revealed. They're a Black Ops unit running off of that bootleg Super Soldier formula that eats you from the inside out, and they go full-on LAPD with Steve Rogers when arresting him at the base of his memorial. It's a beautifully drawn sequence, one that makes absolute fuck-all sense if you don't read the annual, which is not printed in the volume that I own, but I digress. Anyways, the Ultimate Masters of Evil analogs are called the Liberators, and after the Ultimates are crippled from within due to a mole on the team, the US is left vulnerable, and the Liberators launch an attack on the United States of America. We also get the reveal that Black Widow was the mole the entire time, because who could have foreseen the traitor of the team being the Russian spy? Actually, given this story's time and place, that reveal is actually kind of perfect. It's one of those so obvious nobody could have seen it coming kind of twists. And it's a real gut punch because of the romance that was building between Tony Stark and Natasha, which I've heard more contemporary Marvel fans take issue with. But, I mean, Black Widow originally starts out as an Iron Man villain who has some romantic tension with Tony. So again... In the same style of every other reinvention, Mark Miller and Brian Hitch make to Marvel lore. This is one of those remixes that I think not only works quite well for the story, but also calls back to classic Marvel Comics lore. And look, I don't mean to soy face over this comic book, but I honestly God, cannot help it because up to this point, between Ultimates and Ultimates 2, there had been 20 plus issues of build up to this point, and you can quintuple that if you consider the other titles that came out before and filled in the gaps with Ultimate Spider-Man, Ultimate X-Men, Ultimate Fantastic Four, Ultimate Marvel Team-Up, okay, no, maybe not Ultimate Marvel Team-Up, but the various crossovers like Ultimates vs. Ultimate X-Men, Ultimate Six, and the Ultimate Galactus Trilogy, it was all building to this point. And all of the moral ambiguity, all of the shades of gray, they're all washed away. And the stage is set with clear-cut heroes and clear-cut villains. And what we're left with is this grandiose, epic, earth-shattering catharsis. Where it's a bunch of superheroes saving the day from a bunch of supervillains. And this is what I'm talking about when I say that I appreciate the MCU. And I think Infinity War is really fun. And I appreciate Endgame for what it is. But this is my MCU. This is my Endgame. Ultimates 2 is the grand epic finale to all grand epic finales. And the comic ends with Thor banishing Loki to Asgard, all the while Loki is sniveling like some YouTube prankster who fucked around and found out. And it's over. You know, the good guys won. Kind of. So, during the cleanup effort, Captain America has this conversation with Nick Fury. And this is essentially when Steve Rogers comes to the conclusion of his character arc of being the ultimate soldier. He tells Nick that superheroes are not and should not be affiliated with any government agency or used as weapons to seek out any nation's political interest. And this is where the Ultimates officially make themselves independent. And by the end of the series, we're basically left with a 5 plus year origin for the Avengers. Which is something that we've seen many other creators, both at Marvel and DC, try to replicate with little success. Unfortunately, that mission statement doesn't really mean much moving forward, but if you just stop reading right here, it all reads very well. But yeah, uh, that's Ultimates 2. That is my favorite superhero comic book series in a nutshell. Uh, that's why it's my favorite superhero comic book series, hopefully, in a nutshell. And again, despite my love for it, I get why people don't like it, and I get why it's looked on less favorably as the years go by. It's basically Metal Gear if Metal Gear was a superhero comic, which I'm sure is a niche that appeals to like 0.00001% of the population, the population in this case being myself, but I don't know. Uh, this is the gold standard of superhero comic book storytelling for me. And again, quintessential Marvel. This is the definition of what a Marvel comic is and what the Marvel Universe is, and I absolutely adore this comic. But what about you? What are your thoughts on it? Let me know down below in the comment section. Also, if you like the video, hit the like button, share, support the channel. And if you want to see more videos like this, all you gotta do is subscribe and hit that little bell for notifications so you can get an update on my next upload. Uh, anyways, thanks for watching, guys. Sorry it took so long to get this out, but here we are. And I'll see you in the next one.
Uh, until then, happy reading and take care. Goodbye.